God has a way of doing things. When you're preaching through a book of the Bible, and a lot of times people will think, well, how's that going to apply to what I'm dealing with today? And God aligned this subject this weekend for such a time as this, for everything that we're dealing with. You know, we're in a generation of happily ever after. How many of you like to watch Hallmark movies? Let's get a confession here in the house. <laughs> Most of you. You know, uh, let me tell you how uh, Hallmark movies go in our house. My wife has figured out a formula. I don't know if y'all have figured this out or not, but there's a formula to these Hallmark movies that the kiss always happens within the last three minutes. That has nothing to do with my sermon, but that's a fun fact, right? It always, and I, I, I thought, hmm, is this for real? So I timed it, and, and without fail, I, I start from the time, you know, the kiss happens till the time they give you the closing credits, and it, yeah, it's pretty much a three-minute deal. So that might be a spoiler for some of y'all, but uh, I apologize for, in advance for that. But we love the picturesque. We love the the beautiful endings and all of that, and somehow Christians have gotten this idea that everything happens happily ever after for us. That we have no bad stories, no bumps in the road. How many of you have been saved long enough to know that's not the truth? All of us should be lifting both hands. Christ promised difficulty. So in this world you'll have tribulation. But he didn't stop there, but be of good cheer, I have overcome the world. But he promised difficulty. But then you got, on the other hand, uh, you know, these false teachers that, in order to pad their pockets, will promise you health, wealth, and prosperity. But only if you send them, they, they say, sowing a seed into their ministry. And normally they recommend a, a seed of something $1,000 or higher. Uh, but... We have a lot of people disillusioned because a lot of them are being sold a lie. And they don't know what to do with that. So when the difficulties come, what do we do? Do we, do we wilt under pressure or do we, are we able to actually stand up under it? You know, for the book of Acts so far in chapters 1, 2, and 3, things have been pretty good for the most part. But now all of a sudden... We get to chapter 4 and things take a little bit of a turn. Chapter 1, Christ ascended to heaven. He promised the, uh, His Spirit's presence and power so they could be witnesses under the uttermost parts of the earth. We go on a little further in chapter 1. They had a powerful prayer meeting that escalated to the, into the events of the day of Pentecost. Uh, the gospel goes forth in all these known languages. And I mean, uh, thousand, uh, about 3,000 were saved and... Uh, Acts 2 ends with, uh, you know, people, people meeting daily from house to house uh, in the temple as well. And it's a beautiful story. Chapter 3, we looked at the lame man last week and, you know, how he spent all of his life not being able to walk. And then he's healed, he's leaping, he's praising God. Things are great so far until we get to chapter 4. So if you have a Bible, Acts chapter 4 is where we are this morning. Acts chapter 4, and I'm looking at the subject today, this wasn't supposed to happen. If, if you go by everything that the, some of these preachers will tell you, if you're saved, everything's going to be great for you. You'll never have any problems. And if you have problems, it's because of sin in your life, or you, uh, you got this or that problem, and you know, they've always got a formula for why bad stuff happened. Or maybe you're not even saved to begin with. They, they try to plant those lies into your head. But the reality is, we have difficulty. And these early apostles, I mean, they, they, were, they were obeying God. They were doing exactly what He told them to do. Spreading the gospel uh, to the ends of the earth. And while they were doing the right thing, bam! Let's look. Acts chapter 4, starting in verse 1. Now as they spoke to the people, the priests, the captain of the temple, and the Sadducees came upon them. Now, we might 
I'm, I'm reading from the New King James here, and you might say, well, Matthew knew that it came upon them. That, that sounds, you know, that might be okay, might be, might be good, might be bad. Well, you, if you look at the underlying Greek language here, it really means that they approached them suddenly with hostile intent. So it wasn't, you know, hey, let's hang out. This is, um, we don't like what you're doing, and we're going to stop you. Might be a throwdown, but we're going to stop you. Verse 2 says, being greatly, got to flip two pages here, being greatly disturbed that they taught the people and preached in Jesus the resurrection from the dead, laid their hands on them. And this isn't the laying hands on and praying and praying blessing over them. This was laying hands on them and you know, getting ready to do some harm. Laying hands is not, in Scripture is not always a good thing. And put them into custody until the next day for it was already evening. However, many of those who heard the word believed, and the number of the men came to be about 5,000. Now, we hear, we, we hear some good and we hear some bad, but in, in this thought of this wasn't supposed to happen, I want to look at some things about unfair treatment. First of all, unfair treatment often comes from those on the same team. Let, let's, let's back up to verse 1. It was the Sadducees the priests and the captain of the temple that came upon them. It wasn't unbelievers or, or those who weren't unreligious, let me rephrase that because more than likely these were unbelievers, but they were religious people, supposed to be on the same team. And if you think that you won't have unfair treatment from people, sometimes even within the church, I wish I could say that weren't true. But some of the worst treatment I've ever had from people have been from inside the church. I'm not going to go into those stories, but that's often the case. Now, who are these Sadducees? They're primarily political activists who controlled the high priest's office and were prepared to crush the opposition. They denied resurrection, existence of angels, de demons, and any other life beyond this world. They sought to maintain the status quo and their political influence. You're also going to see... Uh, this group called the Pharisees. The Pharisees were primarily teachers who were prepared to argue rigorously for their interpretation of the law, but were also unreasonable men who would urge temperate treatment for those who disagreed. So, and you know we find those in the church today too. I'm fine with you until you disagree with me. You don't dot your I's and cross your T's like me. I am writing you off. There's no way you can be saved, no way you can do this, you can do that. Sickening. But unfortunately, we find it. I won't say any more about that. It's quiet in here this morning, it might be the rain. <laughs> but it says in verse 2, being greatly disturbed that they taught people, the people and preached in Jesus the resurrection from the dead. That, that's the whole reason behind this. They didn't like, they didn't like Christ. They didn't like his message. Although his message was a life-changing message that would benefit people, they didn't like it because it ruined their, uh, all, the, all their attempts to be somebody with their own efforts. Christ says, no, your effort's not enough. He's enough. And for some reason, proud people don't like that. So here they are thrown into custody, verse 3, for it was already evening. The evening was the time when the temple guard cleared the area. So verse 4, many of those who heard the word believed, and the number of the men, now notice that word men, came to be about 5,000. So it's not just 5,000 people, just 5,000 men, so the women and the children are just icing on top of the cake. So we got a whole lot of people here who have trusted Christ. Verse 5, And it came to pass on the next day that the rulers, elders, and scribes, as well as Annas the high priest, Caiaphas, John, and Alexander, and as many as were of the family of the high priest, were gathered together at Jerusalem. And when they had set them in the midst, they asked, By what power or by what name have you done this? So, you'll notice the next thing. They've been asked this question. And they could have cowered down 
and just given in and said, okay, I don't, I don't want to be in prison, I don't want to be mistreated, so I'm going to back out. But no, you're going to see the sec second thing. Unfair treatment often emboldens us. I have seen some of the most timid people in church life become lions because I mean, Scripture says a righteous are as bold as a lion. And when the Spirit of God is working in you, you can find courage to stand up in the craziest times. All hell is coming against you and you are able to stand and it's all because of Him. Let's see how this unfair treatment emboldened Peter in verse, verse uh, 8. Then Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, said to them, Rulers of the people and elders of Israel, if we this day are judged for a good deed done to a helpless man, that helpless man being the lame man back in uh, Acts chapter 3, by what means he has been made well, let it be known to you all and to all the people of Israel that by the name or authority of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified, whom God raised from the dead, by him this man stands here before you whole. They didn't back down. They're like, you ask? I'm telling. It's Jesus and Jesus alone. And I know you don't like his name, but there it is. Deal with it. <laughs> I, I know we're not supposed to be so direct. But that's pretty much what they were saying. You know, I know you don't like it, but here it is. And you've got to deal with the truth however you know, God deals with you. You can reject it or you can accept it, but it's Jesus. And then Peter goes on here in verse 11. He says, This is the stone which was rejected by you builders, which has become the chief cornerstone. Nor is there salvation in any other, for there is no other name under heaven given among men by which you must be saved. He said, your works aren't enough. No, no other religious leader can help you. It is Jesus and Jesus alone. And I know that's not a popular message today. And, and some people may, may even come here and visit and, and, and they might not like the, the fact that we preach that Jesus is the only way to heaven, but it's, it's Bible, it's Scripture, and we're going to proclaim that. But verse 11 is actually a quote from Psalm 118.22. Peter used this to support because he knew he was dealing with religious guys. They knew this stuff. They, they knew what it said from Psalm 118. So Peter lays this out. It's like, okay, I, I can speak on your level. Here's the truth. You know this. The stone which was rejected by you builders... It's the chief cornerstone. Paul later makes reference to that in Ephesians as well. The thing about Peter is he was ready to give an answer of the hope that was within him. And you and I need to be ready to do the same thing. Because people are going to come along and they're going to question your faith. They're going to ask you, why do you believe that stuff? It's a bunch of fairy tales. So... Some guy was probably making up while he's high as a kite. Uh, they're going to come at you with all kinds of things. And what do you answer? You and I need to know our stuff. We need to get into the Word and let the Word get into us so that when our faith is challenged, we have an answer to give them and we can stand our ground. And they, they may love it, they may hate it, but we know what we believe and why we believe it. Peter was that man. And you know, not all that long ago, he was the one that was always sticking his foot in his mouth. He was the cursing fisherman. He was the one that everybody was willing to write off. But he was just the one that God wanted to use to revolutionize the early church. So there's hope. I know some of you, you speak now, think later. I'm not going to call any names, but I know we have at least one in this room. You just bore it out. God, God can use you. God used Peter. God can use you. I promise. He denied Christ three times. And many were just so down on him. But he, I mean, we've seen in Acts 2, 3, and 4, he has been bold and he has stood his ground for Christ. Unfair treatment often comes from those on the same team. It often emboldens us. But I want you to notice the third thing. Unfair treatment reveals the source of our strength. 
Some of us have been through some unfair circumstances in this life and we failed to test. Let's just be honest. We, we, went, through, we went through whatever, you fill in the blank, your, your circumstance. And because your hope wasn't in Christ, I mean, you crumbled. You crashed, you burned. But some of us also have that testimony that we learned from our mistake and we got it right and then we started putting our hope in the Lord and we were able to get through and, and now we have a testimony to the glory of God that we made it through. That we're still alive. That some, yeah, they were willing to write us off but God. Notice what it says here in verse 13. And, and this verse has always interested me. And you'll see why in a minute. Now when they saw the boldness of Peter and John and perceived that they were uneducated and untrained men, they marveled. Let me pause there for a minute. I have, I have had people say, because King James uses the word ignorant, that they were ignorant men. And I've had people say, ignorant. I'm ignorant. So bless God, this gives me a reason to be ignorant and just not choose to know anything or study. Have y'all, have y'all encountered that? Or am I the only one? I have. I've had people to tell me that. It's like, oh yeah, I don't need to watch the news. I don't need, I don't need to know anything. No, that's not what it's saying here. They were uneducated and untrained men. Here's what it means. They, didn't, they weren't trained by the proper rabbinical schools and they were not speaking in submission to the authority of the high priest. That's, that's the thought here. So, so God's not putting a premium, premium on ignorance, but He is saying that God will use anybody no matter their education level. I know pastors who had no more than a 7th or 8th grade education, but they had a love for souls and God used them and they studied the Word and they've been faithful pastoring churches for sometimes 50 and 60 years. So God uses. He uses whomever He wills. But here's where we talk about the source of their strength in verse 13. The emphasis is not on the fact that they were uneducated and untrained, maybe a little rough around the edges, but the emphasis here is they realized that they had been with Jesus. Amen. That is the turning point. I don't care how educated a man or a woman is, I want to know if they've been with Jesus. All of that other stuff doesn't matter. I can come up here and I can be polished and I can, I can give you all this technical stuff. But listen, if I haven't been with Jesus, we've got a problem. I have to be with Jesus in order to deliver the Word of God. I have to be with Jesus in order to lead this congregation. Because if I'm not, we have a problem. We have a problem. They had been with Jesus. But I want you to notice the fourth thing. Unfair treatment can strengthen our resolve to obey God rather than men. Look at verse 14. And seeing the man who had been healed standing with them. So this lame man, he, he, has, he hasn't gone off the scene yet. You know, sometimes we want to go ahead and write him off. Oh yeah, that was, that was great for last week's sermon. But no, this, this melts into this week. He's standing with them. They could say nothing against it. They were speechless. They had the proof right in front of them. But when they had commanded them to go aside out of the council, they conferred among themselves. So, got these guys out of the room and now they're able to speak freely. Here's what they said, verse 16. What shall we do with these men? Or to these men? For indeed that a notable miracle has been done through them is evident to all who dwell in Jerusalem. And we can't deny it. I mean, it, it was... It was public news. They didn't have mainstream media. They didn't have MSNBC and Fox and CNN and local news. But yeah, word got out that this guy who for, we're going to see in verse 22, for over 40 years had been a lame man, couldn't walk. 
<laughs> you better believe where it's going to get out. Because, I mean, he was at, last week we saw he was at the temple every day begging. So now this, this guy is healed. No doctor could do it, but Jesus could. Verse 17 says, But so that it spreads no further among the people, let us severely threaten them, that from now on they speak to no man in this name. They actually thought that maybe if they threatened these guys, they'd shut up. <laughs> they didn't know. <laughs> Verse 18, So they called them and commanded them not to speak at all, nor teach in the name of Jesus. But Peter and John answered and said, Whether it is right in the sight of God to listen to you more than to God, you judge. I, I, I would put the word but here. King, a new King James says, For we cannot but speak the things which we've seen and heard. In other words, if I were to paraphrase this, this we can't help it and we won't stop telling about the Lord Jesus Christ. You can threaten us all you want, but you ain't stopping us. I know my grammar's not correct, but you know what I mean. You're not going to stop us. We have been transformed by the power of Jesus, and we want everybody else we know to encounter that same Christ. Unfair treatment. Can strengthen our resolve to obey God rather than man. But notice the last thing. Unfair treatment can bring glory to God. If we do, if we do this right, if we don't sit there and bemoan and get in, the little, get in our little corner and cry and whine, and we can actually point people to the Lord through this and say, yeah, I was falsely imprisoned. I went through this, I went through that, but God got me through it all. Look at verse 21. So when they had further threatened them, they thought a little more threat, threatening would, would help, they let them go, finding no way of punishing them, but because of the people, since they all glorified God for what had been done. So those, those watching, I... I these leaders saw them as a threat too because they couldn't be swayed either. Other people were glorifying God. And as I pointed out just a moment ago, the man was over 40 years old, verse 22, on whom...